One thing that Git is known for is version control. In fact, that would be, for some people, the first way they describe it. I described Git as protecting code, but you could describe it as protecting versions as well. Versions is a thing which drives me insane when you come and you find somebody's called a video dot final or underscore final because you just know there's going to be a change to it and there'll be final final or new final or final new final. What, what does Git do? It's good to think about things like that because you would end up with software doing the same. And I had a friend in the company and they were producing versions of software and someone wasn't conforming to the company style of naming things and was creating new version 4.new, you know, and all these, these things. But yeah, so actually software has a pretty strong history of having a version numbering scheme. For example, if you look at the latest version of Chrome or Chromium, it's like version 98.0.4758.81. At the time of recording. <laughs> yeah, at the time of recording. Um, or that might just be the current version I've installed, which is when I last updated it. But still, like this is, so what's that? Version 98 is the major one. And then 0 0.0 is the latest minor iteration of it. And then 0.4758 is the latest patch to it. Um, but what they're doing at the same time is they're maintaining older versions. So you can, at any time, if you want to, you can install version 94 of Chromium just by going to their open source community and then downloading an old version. And if you really want, you can, um, it's quite interesting with Chromium, you can see the latest commit that a developer has put into the Chromium repository and you can download that, whether it works or not. You know, <laughs> As a developer, you can download it. Um, but the point is that they've created these versions and they're using Git to manage this version history. And uh, they are using what's called branches within Git to manage old versions that they need to update. So there might be like a patch to an old version which has new fe doesn't have certain new features of a new one, but someone's using because it's compatible with something else, but it still needs a security fix. Absolutely. So whenever they find a vulnerability, they say, okay, we need to update, you know, like Windows 8. If anybody's still using that, we need to make sure that's secure. So they've got to somehow go back to download the code for Windows 8, make that patch to it, and then release probably 8.10.75, which is the latest patch to it. And you can see this in, like, when you get new release notes. You know if you're on your phone and like, Netflix updates to the latest version, you get these release notes saying you know, version 17.5.8 has these things fixed, and it will have like, a little description of what they updated. But what they do is they have these kind of past versions built into what's called a Git branch. So that branch then can then exist forever and they can, you can then switch your code view to that branch in the history and say, I want to update you know, version 16 in case anyone's still using it um, with this fix. And then commit to that and then go, OK, let's check out the main branch again and we'll make updates to the main branch, which is what our main job is. So you find companies use these kind of product release branches essentially to store long term in parallel with the current new updates, other old versions they can update. So in the first video we did, we talked about Git having like a linear history of all your past versions. At some point you can say, okay, I want to branch that linear history into a tree. <laughs> and you can switch between those trees, essentially, using uh, the git branch command. One thing you can do first is you can type in just git branch and it will list all the th things you have. And for most people, if they've never created a branch before, that just shows you the main branch that you're currently on and it will have a star next to it because that's the one it's showing you. If you wanted to see, if you wanted to create a new branch, which is like uh, for developing a new feature, for example, you could type uh, git branch and then have a name, and that will create a new branch from your current point, uh, and then it will be listed if you type git branch again as being one of the branches you could switch to. Do you call that one new or final? <laughs> yeah, new branch. <laughs> so actually that's a really complicated issue because um, teams that are working on codes, there might be 100 developers and they all might need to create a temporary branch. So they've got to have some sort of naming scheme. So it's a good point to make while you're there. Um, but so if you then want to work on that branch, then you have to get check out that branch. So you have to kind of choose to switch your view from the main branch and then say, okay, now I want to view this new branch, which you might have named new, it could be called dev branch. Um, and then what that will do is it will change the, your folder view, which I've mentioned before, to showing the files that are in that branch. So that means you could then add some new files in that branch. You could then commit them to that branch. And then if you git check out the main, you'll see those files disappear temporarily. Although they're stored somewhere in your .git folder as compressed objects, you've chosen to view the main branch, and so it will hide all the ones that aren't related to the main branch. And then when you git check out the dev branch, it will then bring those files back to you and show them to you. 
So it's a, it's a kind of handy way of switching between versions, basically. So that means these companies that have created uh, like a version for 0.45 of their software, um, they can, if they ever want to switch to it, they check out, you know, branch version 0.45, and then they could work on it and then see those files, and they can check out the main again, or whichever one they're supposed to normally work on. We can also talk about git tag. So git tag is kind of a handy feature where you can name a point in your history with a friendly name. So instead of saying, I want to check out this hash code of like a past commit, you can say, okay, there was one point in time, which is when we finished version 4.5. And we can give that a friendly name so that if I ever want to, I can say git check out 4.5 and it will just download 4.5 for me. So it's a way of giving things friendly names you can use. Lots of companies use like a B in their naming scheme for beta or RC for release candidate, which is when they think that this, uh, the updates to this branch are almost ready to show to the public. And then they will show them to like a, a certain outlet of potential users who test things as a release candidate. Um, and then they will, so they'll name it, they'll get tag it with that release candidate ID so that they can then share a specific friendly named version with people to download. And companies will have all sorts of automation scripts which will take anything that's given a git tag and com compile it as a ready to ship product and test it on a server and then deploy it to a point where people can download and automatically update the website to say there's a new version. You could build all those things in, but in practice, the fact that they're named with git tag as a command is what's important. So what happens is uh, when you first create a file, you create a file in there and make my files green, just to represent as a box and I'll call that version one. At this point, Git doesn't know anything about that because you haven't told it about it. So to get Git to know about it, and what you have to do is... Problem, and I, I think Mike's going to demonstrate this in a second, is that Log4j is like milk. It's like water. It's everywhere.